recent in an interview, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense said that Western allies cannot find a better place to test their weapons and their effectiveness in, and, and even upgrade their weapons. He's, he's, he's imaging Ukraine as a testing ground for Western weapons. How ugly is that? How, how do you see this? Is, are there really Ukrainians? Well, you know, back in 1993, George Soros wrote an article about the future of NATO. And um, he made a couple observations. One was that in order to exist, NATO would need an enemy. And that enemy, of course, would have to be Russia because only Russia provided a, um, you know, a, an opponent uh, of the, 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 the size necessary to justify continued defense spending um, on the, on the level needed to sustain an organization like NATO. But he made the point that um, NATO couldn't fight Russia, not because it couldn't get the military capability to do so, but because a war with Russia would cause lots of body bags to come home to NATO countries. And most uh, NATO nations just would, would not accept uh, the level of death and destruction that would come with a war with Russia. So he said the best thing that can happen for NATO is for them to lure in Eastern European nations under the promise of eventually becoming a NATO member, but never allowing them to join. But because they want to become NATO members so much, they're willing to offer up Eastern European manpower that can then be married up with NATO technology to confront Russia, bring pain to Russia. And the good thing about this equation was that no NATO body bags were coming home, that NATO was sacrificing East Europeans to do its bidding. Now, when I first read this, um, it sickened me. It sickened me even more when Ann Applebaum, a Pulitzer Prize winning writer for um, I believe she writes for The Atlantic now, um, echoed Soros's uh, uh, theory um, in a recent article about the Ukraine conflict. But to hear the Ukrainian defense minister embrace this notion as something positive uh, just shows how depraved uh, the Ukraine government is. Um, and, and how unworthy they are of um, being able to govern over the Ukrainian people whom they're sacrificing by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and, and, and it's also how depraved NATO is. Uh, what, what person that can call themselves human would allow this to happen? And, and more than that, I mean, I say this part is a Marine, and I know there's a lot of people out there that get a little angry when I put on my Marine hat, but hey, it is what it is. Um, be a man. You want to fight? Fight. You think you can take on Russia? Take on Russia. Put your own people in the field. If you're an American, put the American Army in the field. Put the Marine Corps in the field. We're the best after all. What are you afraid of? Why don't you put your own people in the field? Why don't you, you know, put your money where your mouth is, so to speak? But they don't because they're cowards. Not the soldiers. It's not their fault. But the people who lord over them the politicians who have made a concerted decision to avoid losing their own resources and a willingness to sacrifice the lives of others, not because we care about those people, but because we want a, a broader policy objective of weakening Russia. We're willing to sacrifice Ukraine and Ukrainians to weaken Russia, but we're not willing to do that by using our own flesh and blood which tells you then that this isn't really an important objective because if it was truly an important objective, we would put our forces on the ground. We're killing hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians on a lark, on a whim. And that's, um, that's deeply disturbing. Scott, they're, they're, they're talking about Ukrainian in this counteroffensive, they're gaining lands, they're gaining momentum. Is that real? They're making they're, they're making this up, or, or the Ukrainian are really gaining land? 
<laughs> I mean, I'm sure somewhere on the front line, uh, a Ukrainian platoon has captured a trench line. A uh, Ukrainian company has fought their way uh, through to a piece of, uh, of critical terrain. Uh, but everything that they're capturing is still in the gray crumple zone of the uh, Russian defenses. That area of flexible defense designed to absorb a Ukrainian attack. They haven't reached the first primary defensive line of a Russian defensive network that has three major defensive lines. And what they don't say, I mean, yes, you know, we get the telegram channels, we get, you know, the Ukrainians advancing here, taking three buildings here, taking something here. But for the most part, after they file that report, what they don't say is that the Russians immediately hit those Ukrainian troops with glide bombs, 500 kilogram uh, glide bombs with artillery, with um, the TOS-1 and TOS-2 flamethrower system, thermobaric weaponry that literally sucks the lungs out of, uh, out of its victims, um, and uh, slaughters the Ukrainians that are there, um, making the people that have occupied that territory either die, they get wounded, or they, they have to retreat. Um, the Ukrainians are achieving nothing other than massive death and destruction. The, any territory they've gained is usually given back to the Russians or is so useless in the overall scheme of things that Russia says, keep it for now, we'll just kill you tomorrow. Zelensky said just, I think yesterday, he said that he wanted to start these counteroffensive sooner before this line of defensive of Russian army being formed in that area. Do you think he has a point in his argument? Well, I'm, you know, I, I, I have to ask Zelensky to um, recheck his chronology. Um, I remember that at the Ramstein contact group um, in um, Ukraine contact group that was held in Ramstein, Germany, back in October, uh, General Zeluzhny said, if you want us to carry out a counteroffensive, we need hundreds of tanks, hundreds of infantry fighting vehicles, hundreds of artillery pieces, uh, unlimited ammunition, aircraft, everything. Uh, and then in the in the months that uh, that followed, you know, NATO struggled on whether or not they were going to provide the Leopard tanks, the um, the, the 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 Martyrs, and et cetera. But you know, it began in October. But even if the equipment had been provided instantly. Um, you'd still have to train the people on this equipment, et cetera, so that the earliest this offensive could have began would have been um, in March or April. But the weather, the, the Rasputitsa, the muddy season is there, so you can't do the offensive until the weather clears up. So Zelensky um, is lying, straight up lying. Because the other thing that is, is that once the Russians began their partial mobilization back in October, similar time frame, uh, they immediately began digging these these networks. Uh, these these trench systems were were dug and prepared over the fall and early winter, and fully manned with trained personnel uh, by spring. So at no time was there a situation where Zelensky was sitting on a potent counterattacking force when the Ru and the Russians had no defensive capability. The Russians have always had a defensive capability. Uh, Zelensky has only recently acquired a counterattack force. Um, and so again, this is this is political spin that has nothing to do with reality. How about this rhetoric coming out that Russia gonna attack uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant? We see we see it in mainstream media that it's immediately it can happen any moment. Russia gonna attack this nuclear power plant, and we see that uh, Gary Kasparov his his. He's, he tweeted yesterday that Russia blew up the the, the, the dam that they they're gonna do the, the same thing to the this nuclear power plant. How how do you see this? Are the are, are Ukrainian getting ready to to blow up this nuclear power plant? No, they're not. I said it uh, uh, several days ago, and I'll say it again. Um, no, even Ukraine's not this stupid. Um, Ukraine has been talking up for some time now about the potential of a nuclear catastrophe at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in a, in a, in a vain effort to get the um, international community to intervene, to come in and take control of the plant to create a demilitarized zone around it. 
um, under the belief that uh, those international parties who created this international zone would be comprised of um, people from nations who recognized Ukraine as the uh, rightful sovereign of this territory. Therefore, this territory will become Ukraine again. That's what the Ukrainians want. They want to kick the Russians out to get this back. Russia is not playing that game. Uh, Russia will not yield. Russia, this territory is now legally, from the Russian perspective, constitutionally, part of Russia and therefore can never be yielded back to Ukraine or any um, third party international peacekeeping force. This is never going to happen. Zelensky's in a situation right now where um, he's losing and um, you can't spin your way out of this reality. The, the reality is, um, you know, Ukraine has lost this war and the only hope Ukraine has is on international intervention and this whole uh, concept of attacking Zaporizhia, the Russians blowing it up, uh, the Russians claiming a false flag from Ukraine has been Ukrainian propaganda. Um, it will never happen. And the, and the reason why is that Ukraine could never get away with it. Uh, the, the, you know, to, to create a nuclear incident, um, it, it's, it's the most easily forensically investigated um, uh, incident imaginable. Uh, once you put radioactive particles on the ground, uh, science kicks in and you'll be able to trace the particles back to their point of origin. You can't hide where it came from. Um, it, it's just stupid in the extreme. And I'm, um, I, I never believed Ukraine was going to do this. Um, I always believed that this was a propaganda ploy to get um, NATO um, interested in discussing potential scenarios of intervention. Um, but it's failed because remember, it was supposed to take place on the 5th of July. Today's the sixth. Didn't happen, never will happen. As you mentioned, that Zelensky is losing. He's losing badly, but but he's getting more desperate. And for his administration, I think to to gain more weapons, more money from the West, do you think even with this level of desperation, he's not gonna do that? Well, clearly, the nations are, are saying they want to support Zelensky, and there's efforts underway to get more military support to Zelensky. Uh, the problem is um, there's just not enough uh, military equipment, and Ukraine's run out of trained manpower. Uh, the Ukrainian army today um, is the strongest it's going to be. It will never be as strong as it is today, and uh, today they're going to lose 800 to 1,000 soldiers dead on the battlefield, another 2,000 soldiers wounded. Uh, those soldiers can't be replaced uh, with trained manpower. So tomorrow, Ukraine will be weaker. Tomorrow, Ukraine will be as strong as it'll ever be uh, because the day after that, it's going to get weaker. And every day that follows, the Ukrainian army is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And there's nothing uh, Zelensky can do to change that reality. Um, so he's confronted with the, the fact that sooner rather than later, uh, the Ukrainian military is going to collapse in the face of a superior Russian military force. Um, and so, yes, there is the desperation right now. He's desperate to get um, international intervention. Uh, and and th this is why he's, you know, demanding to become part of NATO. Uh, you know, he wants to get that Article 5 protection, but uh, NATO is not willing to commit suicide uh, for, for Ukraine. And, um, you know, this is the, the biggest not the biggest, because I have zero sympathy for Zelensky, but you know, you, you do have to feel for a man who um, is responsible for the destruction of his nation, and, and now he's waking up to the fact that it's over, and there's nothing he can do to resolve the situation, and he will have forever go down in history as the man who destroyed Ukraine. When you really look at what happened to Ukraine, and you see just by negotiations, he could solve everything, and none of these disastrous disastrous actions catastrophes could have happened to ukraine every every weapon they're sending to ukraine is gonna be it it seems it, it signifies more disruptions to ukraine not to russia because the war is happening in ukraine not in russia how they how they justify their actions in in the western media i mean the western media has created a, an alternative reality um you know, a narrative that says that Russia is a brutal uh, aggressor who invaded Ukraine without justification, that Ukraine is bravely defending its soil uh, from the deprivations of 
you know, the evil dictator Vladimir Putin, um, you know, and that the, the sacrifice is necessary to preserve, you know, this bastion of European democracy uh, that you know, stands as a shining symbol to everybody. But, but else. Scott, what, what kind of democracy is that? He's not willing to have an election in Ukraine. <laughs> what kind of democracy well, you're, you're, is this? You're, 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 remember, I said this was a, a, a narrative that's being spun, uh, which means it's manufactured, it's fake. Uh, every aspect of it's fake, but it's being sold to an unquestioning, unquestioning audience in the West, uh, especially here in America, uh, and, and in many places of Europe where they simply, because they're so far removed from the reality, um, they they're 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 easily led to accepting at face value anything the media says about the situation in Ukraine, and um, unfortunately, the only way that um, they're ever going to be compelled to change their mind is when uh, you can't tell the lie anymore because there's nothing to lie about, meaning Ukraine will be destroyed, will be annihilated. Um, and, and when that happens, these people will be left to reflect on how it happened and why it happened. And uh, one of the main reasons is that the, their ignorance allowed Ukraine to continue down this path towards um, national suicide that could have been ended at any time. Um, you know, whereas Ukraine has walked away from negotiations, I think we need to understand that Russia has been seeking a negotiated into this fight from the very beginning. They they try to avoid a conflict, uh, A, by uh, trying to get Minsk, the Minsk Accords to be implemented, B, when that failed, by trying to get the uh, United States and NATO to uh, agree to discuss a uh, treaty uh, for the new European security framework. When that got rejected, they attempted bilateral negotiations with Ukraine to stop this. Up until the moment Putin ordered troops across, they were still, the Russians were still trying to negotiate a peaceful resolution. And then once the war started, people now know that Russia's goal wasn't to defeat Ukraine, to occupy Ukraine, but to get Ukraine back to the negotiating table, which Russia su succeeded in doing. Uh, three meetings in Gomel, Belarus, followed by several meetings in, in Turkey uh, where the Ukrainians initialed a, uh, a draft treaty that would have ended the war had they attended the signing ceremony in Istanbul scheduled for April 1st of 2022. Had they gone there, um, Kherson would be Ukrainian today. Zaporizhia would be Ukrainian today, including the nuclear power plant. Um, Donetsk and Donbass would be independent, um, but they would be called upon to carry out a, a referendum on uh, you know where they want to go, and this would give Ukraine a chance to make the argument that they should remain part of Ukraine. Crimea would stay Russia, but Crimea has been Russia since 2014. Some people argue that it's always been Russia, but um, you know more importantly, 350,000 Ukrainian soldiers would be alive today. 20 million Ukrainians displaced from their homes would have homes. Children who you know, otherwise would have stable family environments, going to school, getting an education, wouldn't be scattered around uh, the world, many of them orphans now, all of them doomed to uh, to an uncertain future. Um, you know, the Russians have sought a peaceful resolution to this problem of negotiated settlement. Um, and uh, it's been Ukraine that said no. And now that the reality is hitting home, I don't think the Russians are in the mood to negotiate. I think Russia's in the in, in the business of um, never again allowing itself to be used by uh, disingenuous players in Ukraine and the West. Remember, Minsk Accords. Uh, we now know that the Ukrainian president, former Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, viewed them as a sham, uh, simply to buy time to build a Ukrainian army capable of liberating the Donbass and Crimea. And Poroshenko was supported in this by Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, and by Francois Hollande, the French president who signed the Minsk Accords, and um, who were supposed to be pressuring Ukraine to uh, to fully implement it. But they both agreed, no, this was a sham. We were just buying time. The only honest broker at the table was the Russians, um, and, and they were the ones who got um, you know put out. How 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 could Russia ever trust a Western negotiator again after that? How could Russia? So I don't think Russia's in the business of trying to um, allow the West and Ukraine to snatch uh, victory from the jaws of defeat, to, to get through negotiation what could not be gotten through the battlefield. Russia sacrificed too many men, too much material, uh, too much national treasure um, to, to finish short of 
the ultimate objective of demilitarization, the destruction of the Ukrainian army. And um, I think that's the direction we're heading. Russia will destroy the Ukrainian army. Yesterday I was talking with a Russian journalist. He was criticizing Putin for starting this war in February just using 100,000 soldiers. He, 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 he was thinking that Russia didn't start it very good with good number of so soldiers. And you see this this criticism that's come from the right side. I'm thinking that even after going in, he was still hoping, negotiating with, with the West. Do you think that was the case? 100%. I mean, Putin, uh, we know it's the case. Uh, you know, Putin has presented the signed documents uh, of the peace treaty that uh, that was being negotiated with Ukraine when uh, an African delegation from seven African nations showed up in Russia uh, seeking to, you know, implement and get Russian acquiescence on an African uh, peace plan. Putin put the treaty out there for the first time and said, Here, it's signed, 18 annexes discussing everything. Um, we had an agreement. We could have, this war could have ended, but it was Ukraine that uh, that walked away. There's no doubt about it. I would ask the journalist that you spoke to, and maybe you can ask him the next time you speak, um, would he have preferred that um, that Putin um, carry out a war of aggression against Ukraine, occupy the uh, Ukrainian capital, lose uh, unbelievable numbers of, uh, of Russian lives, uh, sacrificing hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian civilians, um, only to get bogged down in a conflict that would require general mobilization of, of, uh, of Russia, um, disrupt uh, Russian economic uh, recovery, um, cripple the Russian economy, and create a tremendous amount of domestic unrest uh, in Russia. Was is that what he wants? And in the, you know the the right answer is he doesn't know what he wants. To be honest, just simply doesn't know what he wants because he doesn't understand the scope and scale of the problem. Or he's a Navalny supporter who wants that because he wants to bring down the Putin government. Um, what Vladimir Putin did is. Um, is put it together a military operation designed, it was called a special military operation for a reason. It was designed to get Ukraine to return to the negotiating table and it succeeded. It succeeded. It was a successful military operation. But because politics is an extension, you know, war is politics, you know, uh, by any other means, um, the Ukrainians backed out. Um, and then Russia was compelled to change course. And you could then, you could be critical of Putin to say, why didn't he anticipate this betrayal? Why didn't he anticipate that? And that's a question that maybe someday he'll answer. Um, but he's already answered it. He spoke to uh, the wives of, uh, of, of Russian soldiers deployed, Russian soldiers who have died. Um, and he apologized to them. He said uh, the, the biggest mistake he made was uh, accepting in um, the, the Minsk Accords in 2014. He said, I could have destroyed the, Russian, the Ukrainian military right then, and it would be all over. We wouldn't be having this conversation. I could have ended it all right then. But when I was asked by the French and the Germans if uh, you know, to pursue peace, I went along with it because I believed that they would actually try to get a peaceful outcome. Um, he was lied to. And so he said, I'll never again make that mistake which means he'll never again make that mistake. He'll never again trust the West to do the right thing because the West is only capable of doing the wrong thing when it comes to Russia. In, how about Prigozhin? Prigozhin was one of the boldest figures in Russia criticizing this special military operation in Ukraine. He finally, suddenly, out of nowhere, I don't know where he came from, out of nowhere, start marching toward Moscow. You see, in that moment, at that moment, 24 hours, all of the mainstream media was reporting that he's gonna take Moscow. He's gonna bring down Shoigu. He's he's a real threat to 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 Russia, admin, to 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 the Putin administration. How do you see the whole situation? What Prigozhin did? Why did? Why why he did that? And what was the motive behind his actions? Well, I think we need to understand who Prigozhin is and who Prigozhin isn't. He is a, um, at best you can call him a businessman. Uh, his businesses um, 
is a restaurateur. He opens and operates restaurants. He operates a catering business. Uh, and his catering business um, carried political favor among the Kremlin elite and got him to the attention of Vladimir Putin. And I guess once you get into that rarefied air of the Kremlin elite, um, you know, if you're a businessman, you get contract opportunities. You get uh, business opportunities that help enrich you. Um, and Prigozhin was given two such business opportunities in May of 2022. Uh, a decision was made by uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, to contract with Wagner PMC, private military company, uh, which already existed. Prigozhin was not a founder. Um, he was a, a, an owner investor um, that came in after the fact. But, um, you know, Wagner existed since you know, at least uh, February of uh, 2014 when it uh, provided the so-called little green men that uh, went into Crimea to uh, seize control of Crimea in advance of Russia annexing that territory. They did so because constitutionally Russia uh, could not deploy troops onto uh, Crimean soil, which was Ukrainian soil at the time, without the permission of, uh, of, the, of the parliament. They needed uh, uh, an action on the part of the Crimean people uh, to justify that. And so the little green men guaranteed the success of the um, Crimean uh, Russians, ethnic Russians, who uh, petitioned Russia to annex that territory. Um, you know, and Wagner then went on to uh, advise the Lugansk People's Militia, uh, as, you know, a couple hundred guys and probably providing advice. Uh, but when the special military operation started, Wagner was not an important part of it. It was still a minor unit providing advice to the Lugansk People's Militia. But when the Ukrainians walked away from the peace treaty, um, Russia began what's called phase two of the, uh, of the special military operation, which centered on the um, liberation of the territory of Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, uh, which had declared their independence, but still had significant percentages of their territory under Ukrainian occupation. Um, the, the Russian goal was now to liberate these two territories and secure uh, Kherson, Zaporizhia, the land bridge between um, Crimea and, and Russia proper. Um, but they they had a, they had a problem because they had insufficient troops. Um, and so, how do you create a combat capable force in Lugansk um, without diverting regular Russian army forces there when you have insufficient forces elsewhere? So the decision was to expand the. Uh, advisory capacity of Wagner uh, and turn them into a, um, a combat unit of, of, a, of a certain size of uh, 30 to 50,000 troops, a uh, standalone combat unit. They could do this because Lugansk was independent. It wasn't Russian territory. So contractually speaking, uh, they could sidestep uh, the ban that exists in Russia on the existence of, of private military companies. Uh, this was Lugansk. And in 1 May of 2022, Prigozhin was given two sweetheart deals. The first sweetheart deal, $940 million, is that he was given that money to uh, recruit a, uh, and train a military force capable of fighting the Ukrainians. What's interesting is that the money that Prigozhin was given only dealt with salaries and bonuses. Um, it didn't deal with equipment. So all the tanks, all the artillery, all the vehicles, everything that Wagner uh, needed was given to them by the Russian Ministry of Defense. And, um, and, and then Wagner developed a very good reputation uh, on the field of battle. This has nothing to do, or, or do with Prigozhin. Prigozhin was simply the money man. He was the in-between, the management in between the Russian government and the Wagner fighters. The real decision-making was done by the um, commander's council which is sort of this round table of five senior uh, Wagner um, officials, um, military veterans, special operations guys, uh, who created a military unit that uh, streamlined decision-making. So it became very effective on the field of battle. Um, Prigozhin had nothing to do with that effectiveness. In fact, Prigozhin, uh, in the early months, denied having any involvement with, uh, with, with Wagner. If, uh, if you recall, um, in the summer of um, 
2022, he was suing Bellingcat, which is the uh, British uh, uh, open source uh, investigation unit. Uh, some people say that it's close to uh, British intelligence, but um, he accused Bellingcat of, of smearing him. He said, I have nothing to do with Wagner. But then on September 27th, I believe, um, 2022, suddenly Prigozhin gave an interview on his Telegram channel where he said, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the owner of Wagner. I, uh, I began on, on May 1st of, uh, of 2014. Uh, he didn't talk about money, but he said, yeah, no, I'm it. And then he began this propaganda blitz. And you have to ask yourself, why that day? Because that day is very important. Why September 27th? Because on September 26th, Lugansk and Donetsk began the process of a referendum vote to join Russia. And by the 27th, it was obvious that Lugansk and Donetsk had voted to join Russia, which means Putin, uh, Prigozhin understood that he was going to lose his contract because the contract is a nullity on Russian soil. Um, and so he came out. And now that we know that, we know the connectivity between the two, you have to assess everything that follows as a PR campaign by Prigozhin trying to win the hearts and minds of the Russian people so that they will insist that Wagner be allowed to exist regardless of Russian law. Um, and, you know, he, he, he recruited prisoners. Um, you know, Wagner had a reputation for being elite, but they recruited inmates, uh, gave them 21 days training and threw them into the heart of the battle uh, where they were slaughtered on the battlefield. Uh, upwards of 20,000 of them died in the battle for Bakhmut. Um, you know, Russia's been accused of human wave attacks. I don't think it's quite that bad, but these are very aggressive tactics uh, that uh, Wagner could get away with because they were sacrificing inmate life. Um, you know, uh, Prigozhin during this time started to criticize Shoigu, started to criticize Gerasimov. And Unfortunately, a lot of people in the uh, Russian military establishment and in, in the civilian world were, were accepting this. One, because the Wagner soldiers um, were providing the only positive stories coming out of Ukraine, the continued advance of the Wagner soldiers, the slaughter of Ukrainians. Uh, when you juxtapose that with, you know, Russian soldiers continue to withdraw uh, in, in, in towards the Lugansk borders, withdrawing from the right bank of the uh, Dnieper River uh, in the Kherson, abandoning in the city of Kherson. Um, for, the, for the Russian population who didn't understand the tactical reasons behind these withdrawals, um, it appeared that Wagner was the only one who was fighting, and that's something that um, Prigozhin was only happy to, uh, to maintain. But um, behind the scenes, um, Shoigu wasn't budging. He said that the Wagner has to become compatible, compatible with uh, Russian law, which means that um, the organization and all of its members would have to sign a contract arrangement with the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense so that they work directly for the Ministry of Defense instead of being independent um, contractors. Prigozhin refused to do this. Um, there's uh, every reason to believe that he actually um, forced the Battle of Bakhmut to continue when the Russian army was prepared to carry out an operational pause to be ready, better prepared to receive the anticipated Ukrainian counterattack. Prigozhin kept that fight going because he needed to liberate Bakhmut to solidify his standing in the eyes of the Russian people that he is a hero worthy of their support. Um, and, 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 and I think that's what he was trying to do. And, and ultimately, um, you know, while he succeeded in getting a two-month contract extension, um, the, the Russian government said on, um, on, on basically on July 1st, you're done, you're finished. Um, there will be no, no more Wagner. And that's why he moved towards Moscow, because he was such a narcissist, had such a big ego that he was willing to sacrifice Russia uh, in order to sustain his his position, his money making a, a position with uh, with Wagner. Um, unfortunately for him, it's failed. Um, Wagner is no more. It's being disbanded. Um, he may get arrested, not for the charge of you know, um, inciting insurrection, um, but for corruption. I always remind people that Al Capone, the famous American gangster, Chicago gangster, uh, who murdered people, who committed robberies and committed, you know, um, various violations of the law, including prohibition, supported prostitution, 
etc. He didn't go to jail for any of those crimes. He went to jail for tax evasion. And um, Prigozhin's being investigated for corruption right now, and there's every reason to believe that he was one of the most corrupt people in Russia. You know, the, the guys he criticized, Shoigu and Gerasimov, Shoigu being the Minister of Defense, uh, Gerasimov, Gerasimov being the uh, chairman of the Russian general staff, uh, they're the ones responsible for the theater of operations. And so, you know, when Prigozhin says, I, Yevgeny Prigozhin, have the magic formula on how to fight and beat the Ukrainians without losing massive Russian lives, uh, you need to reflect on the fact that um, depending on whose numbers you use, uh, the number of Ukrainian killed uh, in the battle for Bakhmut goes from around 55,000 to 75,000. And the number of uh, Russian losses go from 20,000 to 30,000. These are dead. Um, but let's just take the, the two extremes. Let's say that the Russian dead is 20,000 and the Ukrainian dead is uh, 75,000. So we're giving Russia maximum uh, credit for killing, etc. cetera. The, um, the kill ratio is 3.5 to 1. That is, for every three and a half Ukrainians killed, one Russian dies. And Prigozhin's saying that's a good thing. That's the ratio I can give you. Well, the defenses that uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov designed uh, in the first two and a half weeks of the uh, Ukrainian counterattack are responsible for killing 15,000, uh, 13 to 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers. Putin has said that the um, the ratio is 10 to 1, which means that the Russian forces have lost 1,300 to 1,500 forces. Uh, that's still a lot of guys. That's a lot of heavy fighting. But 10 to 1 casualty ratio is far better than, you know, 3.5 to 1. So, again, Prigozhin, and, and the reason why Prigozhin's numbers are so high is that he was sacrificing these inmates. Um and there's reason to believe that he he liked using these inmates because they were cheap. He received money from the Russian government to pay a Wagner standard soldier, which is the Wagner standard is generally somebody who has served at least one, preferably more tours as a contract professional soldier in a combat zone uh, that possesses a specific skill, special operations, heavy weapons, um, so that they don't have to be extensively retrained. They can come in, get familiarization training, and then they can take their skill set and under the streamlined command procedures uh, and uh, you know, set forth by the commander's council, um, perform in a more effective manner on the field of battle than a standard army that's sort of, you know, sluggish, um, and, you know, it, it not as flexible because that's just the way the military is. Um, these guys cost a lot. They cost a lot to pay. And they cost a lot when they die because they tend to have families. The families have to be taken care of, et cetera. Um, Prigozhin went to prisons and, and got inmates. Now, the inmates have no training. Um, they're going to get 21 days training. That's that's nothing. Um, so Prigozhin doesn't have to pay them as much. I don't know what the pay scale was, but it's probably around 50% of that which he paid the other soldiers. Um, what, where's that money go? that was allocated for these guys straight in Prigozhin's pocket. That's corruption. Prigozhin is one of the most corrupt individuals in Russia. And he, you know, in the end, he got caught out. He, um, he had tried to achieve something through um, intimidation. It failed. He had two choices. One would be to do that, which he said he would never do, sign a contract to the Ministry of Defense to convert Wagner into an MOD controlled unit. And all of the soldiers would have to sign similar contracts. Or you could try to overthrow Shoigu, Gerasimov, and by extension Putin, take control of the Russian government yourself and ensure that you have job security. This was all about greed. Greed, plain and simple. Um, you know, people are looking for, you know, 3D chess, 5D chess. I don't even know what that is, but the idea that Prigozhin is such a genius of moving things around. He's trying to accomplish this by indirect approach here, there, and everywhere, or that Putin knew that Prigozhin was going to do this, but he's also playing this game of deception. Putin is not. Uh, he, yes, he's a former KGB officer, but as somebody who's watched his speeches and watched him uh, you know, perform his duties as a public servant, 
for the past 20 plus years now, uh, there's nothing disingenuous about the man. He, uh, when he speaks, he speaks openly, honestly, with firm conviction. And history shows that when Putin says something, he does something. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't imagine a, a situation where Prigozhin thought that he could um, overthrow this guy, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Putin, you know, Putin has come out and called it what it is. He said that Prigozhin committed treason, and that's exactly what Prigozhin committed. But Putin gave Prigozhin a waiver, a pardon for this armed insurrection. But he didn't give him a pardon for financial crimes. There's a reason why Prigozhin's said to be in St. Petersburg and perhaps Moscow, because he's being investigated. He probably has been indicted already on corruption charges, and uh, they're going to figure out how to uh, uh, how, how to present this to the Russian public. Before this war started, the mindset in the West was the, the sanctions going to crush down Russia. But now we are seeing that in Europe, in, in France, there is a lot of riots. People are not happy with the situation there. How did it play out for Europeans? Well, I think you and I have had this conversation before when I predicted, I said in the summer of 2023, there's going to be revolutionary change going through Europe, that the uh, elected officials who got Europe in this war are going to have a hard time holding on to power. Now, I can't predict the future, and I have to be honest with you, um, while I find it ironic that um, you know Macron, who sought to destroy the Russian economy and bring suffering to the Russian people uh, through economic sanctions uh, to kill Russian soldiers on the battlefield um, is now, you know, suffering at home. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's like, yeah, that's karma. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, I'm somebody who's been to France. I, 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 I love France. It's a great nation, uh, interesting people, a tremendous culture. Um, beautiful. And uh, I don't wish this on France at all. Uh, the other thing we have to recognize, too, is that much of the problems that are manifesting themselves in France today have nothing to do directly with the Ukrainian conflict and everything to do with uh, French um, immigration policy and the, uh, the inability of France to integrate these minority communities and therefore making them feel to be um, you know, inferior, um, treated uh, disproportionately poor by the police. This started with what appeared to be the execution of a 17-year-old. Uh, I know people will say, uh, he was driving recklessly and da-da-da. It's not a death penalty, but he was killed because um, a cop pulled a, pulled a gun, pointed his head, and pulled the trigger. Um, that's why these riots are taking place. So, you know, you, you can't say that France is... Uh, you know, is, is the standard upon which the rest of Europe will follow. Um, although one would say that the unrest in France um, is probably also predicated by growing public uh, discontent over the economic situation in France, the lack of opportunities. And um, that's brought on by the fact that France can't afford the socialist type uh, system that it has built for itself because it's going bankrupt because of the war in Ukraine. So there is, there is, you know, indirect relationship there. Germany is becoming a deindustrialized state. That's not me saying that. That's a German think tank coming out and saying, yeah, we're, we're deindustrializing ourselves. Um, you know, Germany is looking at economic collapse square in the face. So is England. It's an economy in recession. Nothing's working for the British. Uh, you know, so they're they're going down. They've already had, I mean, Boris Johnson, uh, Truss, and now they're into, uh, you know, their, their, their third prime minister. Um, you know, so in a way that is, uh, you know, representative of, of, of some sort of political decay uh, in, in Great Britain. And we don't know how long Richie Sunak's going to last, um, you know, uh, when, when he's going to fail, when he's going to collapse. What we do know is the British right now are in a death spin um, that whose, whose trajectory takes them to the ground, not to the air. Um, and we can go down through NATO and just look at all the different NATO countries, all the G7 countries, and, you know, the fact that none of them are better off today than they were well, before the war started. Whereas Russia, um, you can make the case that Russia is not only better off today economically than they were when the war started, but that Russia, the Russian economy is the healthiest it's been ever. And one of the reasons why I make that statement is that 
you know, prior to um, the sanctions, uh, the Russian oligarchs were making money in Russia, but that money was leaving Russia, fleeing Russia, being invested outside of Russia, wasn't being reinvested into Russia. But now, thanks to sanctions, uh, this money is still being made. But what do you do with it? You can't take it to Monaco. You can't take it to, you know, Nice, saint Tropez, London. You have to reinvest it into Russia. And so there's this tremendous amount of reinvestment, which then creates this economic engine of growth, new businesses, making money. The money can't flee, so it's reinvested. Growth. And this growing Russian economy is now becoming increasingly attractive to uh, the world, especially Asia. And you see a lot of Indian, Japanese, Chinese companies starting to uh, to invest heavily in into Russia. So uh, the sanctions have, have failed egregiously. Uh, it's backfired uh, tremendously. Uh, and, and people don't know what to do. I mean, you know, I think the Europeans are starting to say, yes, yeah, sanctions haven't worked. And yet they just passed, what, the 17th round of sanctions? Um, and the same thing with the United States. We know it's not working. Uh, Senator Angus King, the ostensible independent senator from the state of Maine, uh, held a hearing where he, you know, bemoaned the fact that um, the sanctions haven't worked, that backfired. And he wants to know how that happened, why that happened. Well, because you don't know anything about Russia. Uh, you know, when you put together sanctions, which are designed to be a solution to a problem, um, if you haven't defined the problem correctly, then the solution doesn't work. It's a solution to nothing, oftentimes making the situation even uh, more dire uh, for the people who started it. And right now, the United States and Europe are, are facing um, economies in crisis because of the uh, blowback from their sanctioning of, of Russia. We talked about Gary Kasparov. He's, he's part of a a forum called Oslo Freedom Forum. These entities, these institutions, these units, they're getting budget from where? These NGOs are pumping money in these in these institutions. How how do you see this? Where where they where where the money come from? Well we know where the money comes from. The the money comes from uh, grants provided by um, fronts for nations who have anti-Russian policies. Um, I mean, an organization uh, such as, it's the Oslo... Freedom Forum. Freedom Forum. Uh, they publish where the money comes from. Go to their website, about us, you know, funding. They'll say, Are we, you know, we get a, a grant from the National Endowment for Democracy. Da, 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 da. You can see exactly where their money comes from. You know, private donors. Well, we know what that means. Um, but the, the, you know, and some might even get straight up grants from, from, from nations. The British have been very effective at funding um, in, in, uh, organizations such as this. Um, you know, but what, what's interesting is uh, the, the two things. Um, Kasparov, what do you think the cons his constituency is in Russia today? I mean, if he went to Russia right now and said, I am Gary Kasparov, world famous chess player, and I want to run for president against Vladimir Putin. Putin could say, we're, we're, we're holding an election today. Or how much time do you need, Gary? You want, you want a month, two months? How much time do you need? I'll give you all the time in the world you need, Gary. Um, you won't get more than 2% um, of the vote. And that 2% aren't voting for you because they like you. They're voting for you because they hate me. They, they'll vote for Navalny. They'll vote for anybody, but they don't like you. You'll never get anything more than that. Right now, uh, Putin can point to 76, 80% support but that's, those are people who are firmly in his camp. But if there was an election, um, well, we have to ignore that the Communist Party continues to be a, a, a viable political force in, uh, in Russia. So you know, the Communist Party can pull in you know, 12 to 20 percent on a good day. Um, but right now in the age of um, you know, ca capitalistic success, the fact that the Russian economy had the Russian economy shrank significantly and failed to rebound the ironically the communist party would probably have um you know, been able to increase its uh, support to the point where it might have been able to challenge vladimir putin um but because the economy is doing gangbusters 
There's no traction for the Communist Party. We're against capitalism, except capitalism saving us right now because people are investing in. So Putin, Putin is firmly entrenched. Kasparov is a nobody, nobody. He has, I mean, I, why the West continues to give voice to people they try to convince their audience, uh, you know, are um, respected people, uh, people of, uh, of power, people of influence uh, in Russia, uh, people whose opinion matters. Um, Kasparov's none of that. I mean, I'm not going to say his opinion doesn't matter because he's a human being. He lives in the United States and uh, free speech means, you know, the fact he, what matters is your ability to speak freely, and Gary Kasparov is speaking freely. Yeah, Gary. Um, but his words are meaningless because he has no connectivity with a viable constituency in Russia that could manifest uh, the, the policies he espouses. Um, he's literally speaking to the wind. Uh, he's not speaking to, to any audience, and that's pretty much the um, no any audience in Russia. And that's pretty much the reality of the totality of the Russian opposition. Um, you know, there are many politicians in Russia today who uh, who are opposed to Vladimir Putin, but who will continue to support Vladimir Putin because Russia's at war with the collective West, a war of existential survival, and they're willing to subordinate their you know political differences uh, for the greater good. And so, you know, Putin is as powerful and as popular as he's ever been, and there's nothing out there on the horizon that's going to change this. Let's talk about Biden and his, we know that they, they, they found cocaine in, in White House. Do you think that Biden going to be able to be the, the nomination of the Democratic Party for 2024? Or yeah. is there yeah. any chance for RFK Jr. in Democratic Party? How do you see this? Look, RFK Jr. is already polling at 20 percent, 20 plus percent. Um, that's pretty good. Um, he, in many cases, he, he, he compares better to the American public than Joe Biden does. Uh, there's this growing awareness that, that Biden uh, not only is somebody who um, has bad policies, um, he's had bad policies, he's supported bad policies uh, ever since he became a U.S. senator. So this isn't new. Um, but what, 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 what is new is the fact that, um, his brain doesn't work anymore. I mean, this is an old man. This is a man who has clear cognitive issues. There are moments when I don't know whether it's through artificial, uh, reinforcement of his body through the introduction of, uh, substances. I'm not suggesting he was the one snorting cocaine, but somebody with a similar last name probably was, um, that, you know, but this is a man who is, is literally diminishing in front of the American people's eyes. And it's an embarrassment. It's a humiliation to the nation. And, you know, we have significant time before the November election, and he's only going to get worse. He's not going to get better. And, you know, sooner or later, the Democratic Party is going to have to confront the reality that this, this man is... Um, you know, not just a political liability, he's a danger to, to America because his brain isn't working and you need a president whose brain is working. And so as long as uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. can, um, you know, himself stay scandal free and, um, and continue to, you know, put out a message that uh, on, on almost every important front contrasts sharply with uh, you know, the Biden administration, especially in foreign policy, especially about the war in Ukraine, especially about nuclear weapons uh, and the need for disarmament. I, I think you're going to see that, um, you know, his support will, will grow larger and larger and larger. And I actually believe that he can be a, um, a viable challenger to, uh, to, to, to Biden. Then we have Trump. No matter what they seem to do to Trump, he only gets stronger politically. Uh, it's, it's mind-boggling. Um, you know, this should be, you know, DeSantis's moment uh, where you know, Ron DeSantis can come in and step in and say, I am the leadership that the nation needs. Donald Trump served us well for four years, but clearly he's distracted. He has personal issues. Um, I'm, I'm your man. I can be more Trump than Trump, whatever he wants to say and, and see people. But instead he comes out. 
the control that Donald Trump appears to have over the Republican Party, especially in terms of funders, um, is near absolute. And people are very afraid to uh, to call him out for his prior bad acts um, um, or and, and all too willing to uh, believe that you know every aspect of the prosecutions brought to bear against him are political politicized that this is the politicization of the um, Justice Department of the FBI and while at this juncture I can't prove that that's the case we know that the FBI has been uh, collaborating with uh, Donald Trump's enemies we know that they were cooperating uh, and collaborating with the Clinton campaign to create the perception of uh, Donald Trump working on behalf of the Russians. We know this. Uh, we also know, and I don't want to go too far down this this route, but you know, Hunter Biden. There's there, there's reason to be disturbed uh, by what's on that laptop, and yet he's getting a slap on the wrist. Um, you know, uh, misdemeanors that for things that have nothing to do with what everybody saw. Um, you know, and, and he's he's apparently snorting cocaine in the White House right now. Um, but where's the Justice Department? Where's the justice system? Um, Biden has politicized the Justice Department, and this is um, this is bad. Look, I am as critical of the of the Supreme Court as the next person. I think uh, they sometimes make decisions that you know I don't agree with, but that's the the reality of a five four court. Um, on, on, citizen, on, on, on situations to go forward, you know, the court itself is divided, um, you know, closely divided. Um, so the American public will be divided on uh, certain issues. The, the, the real question is, can we Americans accept the political outcome, um, you know, on election day? Um, or are we always going to say, you know, that we're too deeply polarized, that we're going to be divided forever, that uh, if the other side wins, it's illegitimate, um, things of that nature. We, we are deeply divided. We, we have, um, you know, a, a, a conservative right that uh, is rallying around uh, Trump, and we have a liberal left that continues to rally around Biden. And unless we get a um, viable candidate in the middle who can bridge those two, uh, because both Biden and Trump have something in common. A whole bunch of people in their respective parties don't want to vote for them. And if you can bring somebody in who is able to attract those voters, plus the large body of independent voters, and get some defectors, um, you could win a national election. I think RFK Jr. has the potential of, of, of doing just that. I think he can beat Joe Biden uh, in the Democratic primary. And I, th I think if um, he were put opposite um, Donald Trump, that again, unless some scandal arises that we're not aware of, um, because I think only Donald Trump can survive scandals. I don't think anybody else can survive scandal. But I, I, there's no reason to believe. I think RFK Jr. is an honorable person. He's been around. He's he's known. There's some people question things he said about vaccines. People question things he's said about X, Y, and Z. But for the big picture, you know, he is um, he's a man who is clearly trying to follow in the footsteps or at least um you know operate in the shadow of his uncle um president john f kennedy he's so admirable uncle, uh, kennedy. it's so admirable he says very a lot of he when when he talks he lo he makes a lot of sense i think so i'm a i'm a i'm a big fan um i mean look there's a lot of time between now and the election uh so you know i'm not um i, I think many americans are like me you know we, we've got that one vote and we're still keeping that in our pocket uh, and because <laughs> you still you still got to earn my vote, you know. So, if the, you know, right now I'm hearing things I like. I'm seeing things I like. But, you know, I'd like to see uh, Bobby Kennedy get uh, get challenged. I'd like to see him defend his positions. I'd like to see him challenge other people. I'd like to see how he operates. I'd like to see the people he surrounds himself with um, because, as we learned with Donald Trump, you could have been the, the biggest Trump supporter and have been shocked by the fact that you brought a Mike Pompeo and a um, John Bolton into his uh, orbit. Um, people who stabbed him in the back and uh, betrayed him while he was president. Um, you know, he, you know, who's Bobby Kennedy going to surround himself with? Um, because it's those people that are going to define the administration. The president is the chief executive, but you need a whole bunch of people underneath him who 
uh, agree with um, his vision or her vision um, and are willing to implement it uh, with integrity, um, you know, and, and, and such. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of time between now and then, but right now I'm pleasantly, I'm not going to say surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy that Bobby Kennedy is turning out to be um, the man that many people thought he would be as a politician. Don't you think that they're going to bring in somebody like Newsom in this race to replace him? Well, the, you know, they, they can try. Um, I don't think Gavin Newsom uh, has national appeal. Um, he's the you know, governor of California. Before that, he was the, what, the mayor of San Francisco. Um, and, and I think uh, when you take a look at the state of play in California today, it, uh, it's a foreign land when compared to the rest of America. Um, Americans aren't buying into California woke. Um, you know, it works in California, but it doesn't work in the rest of America. And indeed, even in California, again, it's anecdotal, but there's just a lot of people come out and saying, uh, lifetime Democrat, never vote Democrat again, unless Bobby Kennedy wins. Uh, but, you know, a lot of them are saying, no, maybe I'm going to take a long, hard look at the Republican candidate because uh, Democratic politics has ruined California. That's their position. It's anecdotal. I'm not saying that there's polls to back up what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, you you get a feel that, um, you know, there are winds of change uh, occurring in California because it is a, um, a state that's in deep, deep trouble. The homeless. <laughs> How do you how do you even begin to call yourself a progressive land when you have that many homeless that are being that have been abandoned by uh, by society? Do you think he, there is a need for for there is a desperate need for a third party? You, you you remember Bernie Sanders? His voters were not Democrats, were not Republicans. You see, Trump, they're not they're, his voters are not totally. Republicans, you need, you, and you have now RFK. He's he's brilliant. He's he's man of peace. He's man of, I think he's 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 the next generation of leaders in in the United States. Well, remember, he's sixty nine years old, so he's not the next generation of leaders. He's <laughs> he's actually pretty old, long yeah. in the tooth. But I guess compared to Biden, he's still young. So. <laughs> but how how do you see the need for the third party that these guys can? Can, can combine in this party? You know, I'm, I mean, I'm supportive of uh, everybody's right to, um, to pick people that they want. And it would be admirable if a third party could get off the ground. But, you know, the Republican and the Democratic parties are deeply entrenched in American society. Um, and the system has functioned um, to the benefit of the elites of both parties uh, for so long that the uh, you know, they're going to continue to suck the political life out of America. It's very difficult for a third party to gain traction. You can gain traction at the presidential level because that it's a very simplified thing. You know, one person against one person running or, you know, one against two running. Um, but at the local level where, because remember, if you get elected president, you need a Congress on your side who's going to uh, defend you. That, one of the things that Trump learned is that even though he won the election as a Republican, uh, many Republican Congress uh, representatives and senators didn't support him. Um, that he, you know, he was always fighting the Republicans because they didn't, they, they're the establishment. And he was sort of an anti-establishment kind of guy. Um, for a third party, if, you know, let's say you become president, um, if you don't have Congress on your side, you can't accomplish anything. And, um, and the only way to get Congress on your side is uh, to break um, the Republican, the Democratic hold on local America. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a third party candidate and you don't have a system that is trying to get people plugged in at the um, representative level, and remember, your representatives themselves uh, don't appear out of nowhere. They come from a, a from local party uh groups and uh, et cetera, you know, they, 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 they rise their way up from the grassroots level in, in democratic politics or Republican politics. They get, um, you know, they, you have to build a base that's based upon state legislatures, county legislatures. You have this base and from that base, 
you then get people picked for for national election. If the third party doesn't have all this infrastructure in place, it can't compete. And so any third party president we elect is probably going to be a one term president because James Carville's famous statement that uh, it's the economy stupid is timeless. Um, and so if you don't have the, a political party behind you capable of generating meaningful support in Congress, you're going to be stymied. And um, politicians know all they have to do is wait four years and then they can change you out. They can bring in somebody new, et cetera. So it's not the big, it's not the victory people think it is to get a, a president elected from a third party. That president has to have a constituency um, in with political power backing him up or her up or else they will flounder and, and they will be isolated and they'll be voted out four years later. Thank you so much, Scott. It was a great discussion with you. Hope well, to see you, you soon again. Okay. Have a, have a great day. Bye.